Hi everybody. Now today we're going to take the rules of debits and credits and apply them to transactions to record those transactions in the records of our business. So first of all, let's review the rules of debits and credits. You'll recall that it originated with a balance sheet like this. Assets on the left, liabilities and equity on the right. And remember originally we said that the things on the left hand side would be defined as debits and the things on the right hand side would be defined as credits. Furthermore, that when debits go up, excuse me, when assets go up, that will be a debit. When liabilities and equity go up, that will be a credit. Then we're going to say that the reverse is true as well. If an asset goes down, that's the opposite of a debit, namely a credit. And when liabilities or equities go down, that will be the opposite of a credit, namely a debit. Now, let's uh, also mention revenues. When we have revenues, how does that affect the equity of a company? When a company earns revenues, the equity goes up. Therefore, revenues are always credits. And how about expenses? When a company incurs an expense, the equity goes down. Therefore, expenses are always debits. So those are the general rules of debit and credit. Now let's see how we apply them to record tra transactions of the business. Let's say, for example, I want to start up a business making financial plans for my customers and I'm going to charge them $1,000 each. Now the first step is I'm going to go to the bank and I'm going to set up a bank account in the name of my company and I'm going to take $1,000 of my personal funds and contribute it to the company, deposit it into the company bank account, and take back shares of stock. Now, let's analyze that from the point of view of the business. From the point of view of the business, the business has received an asset, namely cash, and also has now created equity. What kind of equity? Common stock. Now, we're going to record this in the form of a journal entry, and this is a simplified version that kind of looks like this, and we're going to follow a general convention. It's not a hard and fast rule. It's a convention of putting the debits first. So here, what happened? The company received an asset, cash. When an asset goes up, that's a debit. So we're going to debit cash for $1,000, like that. And the company now also has equity. What kind of equity? Common stock. We're going to credit common stock for $1,000. Now let's say that's not enough to get my business rolling. So I go to the bank, I borrow $1,000. Now, here's what happens. The bank gives me $1,000. I deposit it into the bank account for the business, and I sign a note payable to the bank. That's a legal document uh, uh, that lists all the conditions of the loan. What has happened from the point of view of the company? Well, the company has received an additional asset, namely cash. So we're going to debit cash for $1,000. And what else has happened? Now the company has a liability. Liabilities are credits. What kind of liability? A note payable. So we're going to credit notes payable for $1,000. Now, I want to stop here and give you a very handy tip that you won't find in the textbooks, but you'll find it very useful. And that is this. Whenever you're analyzing a transaction, the first question you should always ask is, does any cash change hands? We see that if cash comes into the business, that's going to be a debit to cash. And conversely, if cash goes out of the business, that will be a credit to cash. So first you determine what the cash flow is, and then you logically reason what other accounts are involved. And there may be some instances where you'll see the transaction does not involve cash flow, but will involve other accounts. In fact, let's take this next transaction as an example. Let's say now I have five different clients that come into my office. For each one, I prepare a very detailed financial plan, and I charge them $1,000 each. But instead of collecting money on the spot, I prepare for them an invoice that says payment due within 30 days, and they walk out the door with the work in hand. Now, in this instance, no cash has changed hands, but let's figure out logically what has happened. Now, first of all, I have rendered services to my clients. I have done the work. I have earned the revenues. Now, we know that revenues are credits, so let's start with the revenues. We're going to credit service revenue for $5,000.
And now that means we're going to have a debit of 5000 to some account. Now, cash did not come into the business, but the business has acquired another different kind of asset. Do you know what that is? And remember, assets are things that have future value. Here, in this case, that asset is called accounts receivable. That's the money that is owed to our business from our customers. So we're going to debit accounts receivable for $5,000. Okay, now let's say next I need to go visit the lawyer to deal with all these legal issues of my business. I sit down with the lawyer, he handles all these affairs, and I pay him $1,500 on the spot. Okay, cash change hands? Yes. Did cash come into the business or go out? Paying cash out. So, that would be a credit to cash. Let's credit cash like this. Credit cash, $1,500. We're going to have a debit to something. Let's fill that in. Let's think what happened. Well, my business has incurred an expense. Legal expense, right? We know that expenses are always debits. So, here, let's debit legal expense. Okay. Now, let's say we go to the end of the month, and let's say that now I'm receiving my checks from my customers. All the checks from my customers come in. I receive $5,000 in checks. I deposit them all into the business bank account. So, cash come in? Yes. Is that a debit or credit to cash? Debit cash for $5,000. Now, that means I'm going to have a credit of $5,000 to something. So, let's go back to that original transaction when we earned those revenues. Notice we set up a account called accounts receivable. But now that I've collected that cash from my customers, that accounts receivable balance has to go down to zero. When an asset goes down, that's a credit. So we're going to credit accounts receivable for $5,000, just like that. Okay? Now, lastly, let's say come to the end of the month, I decide that what I want to do now is pay back the money I owe to the bank. And just to keep things simple here, let's ignore interest for a moment. Let's just say I go to the bank and I pay them back the $1,000 I borrowed. Now, I'm paying out $1,000, so that's going to be a credit to cash. So we're going to credit cash for, for $1,000. And I'm going to have to debit $1,000 to some account. Which account is that? Well, let's go back to when we borrowed the money. We set up a liability called notes payable. But now that I've paid off the amount that I owe, that balance has to go down to zero. So when a liability goes down, that's a debit. So we're going to debit notes payable. So here you see we apply the rules of debits and credits to be able to record all of our transactions. And we're going to start to think in terms of debits and credits. And here's what I want you to take away from today's lesson. When you're working inside your accounting system, all financial information is expressed in terms of debits and credits. So let's start thinking debits and credits. Let's start getting as much practice as we can using debits and credits. See you next time.